Good morning, uh, diehards, for the uh, last uh, day of the conference. And uh, we do have one change. The second speaker, uh, Jai Pai Dai, could not uh, get a visa, and he will be replaced by Jonathan Schooler, uh, who's an ex many of you know from previous conferences. And uh, uh, Anurban, our first speaker, has a plane to catch, so we're going to get started on time. He can't hear something. Matt? You okay? Okay. So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce another friend of mine, Anurban Banyapadhyay from National Institute of Material Sciences in Scuba, Japan, who has been doing some of the most advanced nanobiology and nanotechnology in the world for the last, what, 10 years? And um, it's a great pleasure. And uh, for those of you who have heard us talks before, you might understand when I say fasten your seatbelts because he's going to take us on a, on a tour and then he's going to depart right afterwards. So uh, uh, his talk is measuring vibrations deep inside a neuron protein complex, even a single protein. Let's give a round of applause for Anurban. Okay, so uh, for the last 12 or 13 years, we have been developing technologies, several tools, and improving it over the course of time to measure very low vibrations and, uh, and signals from biological materials. So uh, our objective of, of our research um, is, uh, is to understand the true structure of information, how biology, biological systems uh, encodes information and how it integrates information. So what we actually do, we measure all kinds of vibrations and their frequencies. So we are not limited to, say, particular um, ionic resonances that happens in a kilohertz scale, um, or particular kind of carriers, say, electrons or magnons. And scales are also free. That means we can go down single uh, atom in the DNA, DNA molecule or inside a protein molecule inside a single alpha helix, or we can go to the, um, by, by creating 3D printed structure of the entire human brain and cavities. And time is also free. We move from femtosecond scale to microseconds, or even slower. And also we make little tools to understand uh, what are the fundamental principles of biological information. So here are some of the people who are looking into different part of it and related to the project. So Chi Shang Poon from MIT, he looks at very lower frequencies and rhythms, biological rhythms. Um, I look at minus 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the 3 hertz, kilohertz, and even up to megahertz. Uh, Daya Krishnanda, is she here? Has she woke up? No. Oh, you are there. OK, so C looks up uh, from 10 to the power 9 hertz, gigahertz to terahertz domain. And Anjan Barman, she look, he looks uh, femtosecond spectroscopy and otherwise up to 10 to the power 16 hertz. So we cover almost entire um, frequency band. And we, do, we take the similar materials, and we, we go for all the bands, entire frequency range. And we try to understand that how the information is being processed. So we look at all time scales. Uh, remember that the technologies used at all time scales are very, very different. Um, but I dream that someday uh, we will be able to take a snapshot of all the frequency ranges, what is happening, what the biological system is doing. On that day, the mystery of biological information processing would be clear. But I think, I foresee that that is nearly 100 years away from, from now, what we have it. So I will take you from the current technology to, uh, to a layer ahead. Two or three time bands, say kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz. So three or four time bands simultaneously. That is the, that is the state of the art technology that we have developed that is the best available in the world today. But whatever we will present, just remember that this is fraction of what is going to happen in the future. Because if someday, if somebody comes up, definitely, definitely someone will come up. If the, if the walk begins, the road will be created. Then entire frequency range 
there will be snapshot, tack, 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 so all simultaneously, and then you will see something very different. Uh, so when we are, uh, many people here talk about quantum biology, chemical processing and ionic uh, resonances and other things happen. Uh, majority of the technologies that we have built is in the, in the broader blue triangle. In those ranges, we have built the technology. So you can understand that even though we claim that we understand, we understand more than the existing biology, still compared to the whole frequency spectrum and domain, it is still limited, limited view, okay? And uh, one thing I would like to say that whatever the protein processing and any event happens, we see the frequencies and phase and their interrelationship. So that means we are not rejecting any part of it. We are just using a different language to represent the same thing. Okay? So there are uh, five major technological challenges that you would have if you want to characterize a biomaterial. First is say fire. Fire, water, earth, ether, and sky I have taken from the fundamental elements that you will find in every single tribals of the world. Somehow they, they created these as fundamental elements. But you have this problem. Because all the biological materials, for some reason or otherwise, whatever energy they take and whatever energy they expel out, infrared is associated with it for some reason or others. And that messes up with all kinds of measurements. Water. Biological materials live in water. And if you do the measurement in water, then if, if, even if water ha does not have any ions in it, then if you put the probe, you will get microampere order current. But you know a neuron when fires, maximum current you get is one nanoampere. An ion channel, when it operates, maximum current that you get is one um, picoampere. So you can understand that we need to work 10 to the power three times or 10 to the power four times lower current flow. So if, if there are abundance of water, you can't measure a single protein or molecule. So just water is your enemy. Earth, Earth has a high magnetic field. And many of the bio biological materials we have seen to generate magnetic flux or magnetic field when charge gets into them. So we call them a new kind of fourth circuit element. So, so Earth's magnetic field is a micro Tesla. And biomaterials magnetic field is 10 to the power minus 10, minus, the minus 9 nano Tesla to, and, and around. But you cannot put a biomaterial inside a squid. So 2010 to 2012, two years of my life we wasted. And then the person who was measuring it, he used to, he used to flee seeing me that he will ask me again to do the squid measurement, that somehow biological uh, magnetism will be able to catch. So we, we developed a completely new technology, flux gate-based technology. And if you come to our lab, we have a whole um, Faraday cage oriented towards the Earth magnetic field and several layers of um, uh, coverage to, to protect the magnetic flux, electromagnetic noise to get that. And ether, wireless communication, that is another thing. So uh, you will find that when you are working with multiple uh, single biomaterials, say two microtubules or three microtubules in a controlled manner, you will find if you are studying one microtubule, its resonance frequencies, the other get modified. So getting a pure uh, measurement is very, very difficult. And sky is the management of imaginary walls. So there is a phase. The phase is associated with every single vibrational frequency. And this, those phase gets messed up, and then one vibrational frequency changes to other and other to other, other to other. So this was the biggest problem that we had for the last one decade when we wanted to understand how the information structure looks like. Because if you are looking at, say, 22 megahertz, say, at a pi by 4 uh, phase, you will find soon it sw the phase switches to 3 pi by 4, and that initiates change in the resonance frequency. So it automatically, or in a particular manner, changes on a particular topology that I had to figure out. And it took 2016 September, first time we figured out the, how the structure looks like. At the end of this presentation, I will show you what we were looking for. And we didn't know what we were looking for, but 
eventually we got it. So when you try to do measurement of biological systems, pure water is 18.2 mega ohm. So if we have a lot of water, then two electrodes will communicate with each other. So you can't get. So you need to reduce the water in the limited. So last year, I wrote a 60-page document on how a student should do the biological um, material characterization. And in that, I have described that uh, you have to reach nanoampere to picoampere domain, and you need coaxial probe. So we invented this probe. And you need to reduce the water layer to two to two two to five nanometers, so it is sufficiently low so that ions do not transmit between the electrodes. Because if that transmits, then all your measurements would come from solution, not from the material. And we showed how the behavior looks like. So when you have a high current, it, you get almost linear behavior. And slowly, slowly, the characteristics changes. When it comes there, like square-like, then you understand that, OK, it's fine. So you have to have a quartz crystal microbalance to see the, how the water, channel, water layer is vibrating. And you have to do that measurement very carefully until you, you reach a particular condition to measure the vibrations. And this, uh, this um, slide has two halves. Okay? The first half is normal coaxial probe-based measurement, direct measurement. And second one is on the living cell with a patch clamp. Uh, uh, I mean, a coaxial patch clamp. So in there, there also you can see oscillations that goes down, down. You see, you, you see hysteresis loop. Then slowly you reach to the peak. But if you take out water less than two nanometers on the surface of the biomaterial, the biomaterial gets destroyed. So you can't work. So it's a very delicate, uh, near stress condition where the where all the measurements were done. So. Uh, the setup is also very complicated. Complicated means as complicated as you can, you can think of. For an example, you need to put antennas and different filters very differently, because uh, DC measurement, that means current is flowing linearly, is very easy. But when AC, or alternating current flows, then two sides get plus and minus, plus and minus very fast. So what happens is that in your measurement, alternating current enters. And DC measurement system, the, the AC current messes up the instrument, and your uh, AC measurement setup is messed up by DC. So you need to use inductor and capacitor very cleverly, and you need to modify different uh, elimination current and lock-in amplifier and several systems you need to put in together. It looks very simple, but when you see it in, in practice, you just get amazed how much complicated, how many cables are there, hundreds and hundreds of cables coming in to do the little measurement in the scale. OK, so there are 10 technologies that we have been um, uh, developing. First is uh, the top right one, uh, number one, that is coaxial tube where you, you have various different kind of antennas. Several of the antennas we, we, we designed by ourselves. Um, and you protect the actual vibrational signature from, from other noises. And then, uh, until now, you knew that patch clamp goes there, Hodgkin-Huxley experiment, where one, one um, glass tube, glass pipette-based patch clamp goes and touches the soma and you see neuron firing. But that days, those days are gone. Now we want to go inside the membrane and see what signal processing is going on. So you put several different probes. And several different probe means each probe has to be hardware independent. So each probe should have its own lock-in amplifier, its own filter, its own circuit. So each one lock-in amplifier costs good lock-in amplifiers $35,000 to $40,000. So imagine you, are, you have, um, you have um, uh, 20 different say, uh, probes you are putting at a different part of a neuron. The problem is, uh, one, one major problem is funding. <laughs> because how do, you, how, do, how do you create all independent sources together? So that kind of, we, we are trying to build a small uh, system uh, for that purpose. And um, magnetic, ultra-low magnetic resonance scanner, because magnetic field and electric field gets isolated in a biological system. That is um, 
uh, Pushpender Singh, one of my PhD students, is, is, is going to submit PhD thesis on that. So most of the biomaterials in Maxwell's law, what you, what you know, that if a cable goes, if electric field goes this way, magnetic field goes perpendicular or complementary to each other. But in the biomaterials, when the symmetry is designed in such a way, I, I explained all in, in greater details in the quantum biology workshop. I'm not going to talk about it today at all. But what I said was that if you send in a biomaterial electromagnetic field, it isolates magnetic and electric energy in two different places. It gets, it gets filtered out. And that's why if you put charge in a particular domain where the electric energy is much more, you can mo modify the magnetic flux. Why magnetic flux is needed? Because magnetic-based communication is very good in water. Because water systems cannot, cannot withstand electromagnetic wireless communication. It damps out. And it's non-reliable. So th this kind of several, uh, uh, several technologies we are now going to bring. Now I will get into uh, the results. So this is a classical neuron firing that you observe. And we are seeing this since 1962, the day of Hodgkin Huxley. Now with the new technology, what we can do, we can image what is happening in the kilohertz time scale. So you saw a lot of kilohertz data yesterday from Jack. So kilohertz time scale means ion suit flow. So if you image the ion flow when the firing is occurring, and at the same time, what happens to the dipoles or the, or the, or the polar molecules that are inside at a faster time scale? If you see, then you can find that you can see in the middle, these are the frames of scan shots of time to time. If you, were, if you, if you, if you, can, if you miss this place, you can go to the, our, our paper last year uh, published there. We have explained it in greater details. So you can have a um, um, kilohertz time scale. You see the firing, how it goes on from Soma to, to down towards the, towards the junction how the ions flow, and at the same time, how the dipolar energy flows, or the electromagnetic energy flows. So you can see that, uh, you can find that uh, the dipolar energy is much faster. So I will show you a video in a moment. Then you can understand how this thing occurs. So left part is just microscopic image. And you can see the time-lapse image of how the action potential builds up at a very different time scale, which was unseen until now. So you get a very different kind of view. So now the firing will start. Firing starts means you will see kilohertz ions are propagating from top to the bottom. And you will find after that energy diffusion beyond junction. This is a three-neuron case, same, same, same study, but three-neuron case. So from neuron one to neuron two. So you will see that when you see ionic firing, you just observe that one neuron is firing. But when you see the dielectric uh, polarization image of the, at the same time, you find that neuron one basically searches for neuron three, neuron two, and many different places. Energy is going and coming back, back and forth. And finally, it is decided. How? We don't know. But we, we take the image, and we see that it is finally decided. And after that, maximum energy goes in that direction. So basically, it's a search and find process that, is, and that was hidden. But uh, the, the complete mechanism, uh, revealing complete mechanism would take time. So we wanted to understand that inside neuron, there are microtubule bundle, and there are uh, rings of um, uh, beta spectrin and 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 uh, um, anchorin G and uh, actin, they also make a ring-like structure. So, how does that that behave? So these kind of structures, when when we did electric and magnetic field simulation, we just put a port at the back and we pump electromagnetic signal at different frequencies to find out where, is the, where could be the possible resonances. And actual structure, you see, first magnetic field is much more than electric field. In, so it is increasing. So when you learn in your brain, actually what happens, axonal branches goes on increasing or decreasing, new branches form. 
So what happens is magnetic field first increases, then electric field goes on increasing, then both become equal. So you are changing the length, but at, at specific length, at every single length, it increases. It has a very definite signature of electric and magnetic field distribution in it. So we did um, uh, uh, simulation to understand uh, what is going on inside. And we repeated that for, for um, uh, axonal core, single microtubule. You can, you can find that magnetic uh, energy is, is dominating when you see the 360 phase at resonance, how it is clocking. So beep, 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 or the resonance fluctuations, vibrations. You can see this is the magnetic energy, and then this is the electrical energy. So 360 degree, you can see how the clocking occurs. And also in the tubulin, tubulin protein. OK, so now I come to, come to a point when we try to understand how the vibrations are distributed. So we, we very soon, we started our study. We understood that the vibrations are not random. They have some relationship in between them. So we took neuron, microtubule, and tubulin, and horizontally and vertically. Um, both ways we applied, because we wanted to get 3D. But until now, our technology does not support that. So we, in future, we will try to build technology to get the 3D information architecture directly. But uh, until, uh, I mean, at least up to now, get satisfied with 2D. But this is not the true information structure that I, I would like to want. So we, we get two vertical, um, vertical fields, and then we try to understand what are the resonance frequencies. Then we can find the triplet of triplet bands. And triplet of triplet means uh, three of them and uh, three of them. So we repeat it with many different proteins. And the different proteins have different signatures of these resonance bands. Uh, one video I would like to show. This video you have seen many, many times. The sound that you are hearing can you guess, get some noise? You got? OK, you, you bypass others. Because noise is a mode of communication that we think. Anyway, so, so the, so the t -t 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 or t -t 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 sound that you get is, is nor or normally recorded in, 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 um, in a neuron firing. But, oh, you will also not get this sound. Can you hear anything? This is sonification of the resonant band that is vibrating for one peak. So until now, you could hear only tick, 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 tick. So if one tick is resolved, One tick is resolved before, before one firing takes place. That is the, that is the one uh, nerve impulse. If you see time scale wise, what is happening at the tubule, uh, microtubule bundle in the whole axon structure, how its vibrations are going on. So you see, just to make one tick, there are 72 different frequencies which are topologically in a particular manner, and that vibration goes on just to make the one tick. So that is what happens in science. We, every time what we do, we observe something, technology advances, we see the same thing in a much more higher resolution, and some more better picture comes out. So today I am presenting this as one tick which you observed in 1962. Now you can see 72 different picks inside. But much, much later, maybe 80 years or 100 years from now, somebody will come and they will take one pick and they will go even farther. So we can't go at this moment farther than this just because of the limitation of the instruments and the electronics. OK, so uh, that is the downs of tubulin protein at different resonance frequencies. And then tubulin dimer, and then microtubule. Similarly, we repeated the dance at different resonance frequencies, how they look like in quantum tunneling images. Um, monomer, dimer of actin, and the actin whole polymer. So, so it, it, it is characteristic of frequencies. So particular frequency, it dances in a particular way. So what is the structure of information? So this was the most interesting part of my, my I mean, my research, because I, I, I always wanted to see 
that what is the unit of information, then the rest thing would follow. So in bits, uh, you have 0 and 1. In qubit, you have a phase space. So 0 and 1 are the classical points. And through the phase space, you can go infinite possible ways. But we suggest that if you take uh, this clocking block sphere as your unit of information, then you can explain the behaviors of different biological systems, their resonance behavior, much more profoundly. And how is that? You have a triangle and you have a clock. Just imagine that you have an arc, and you, through the equator you move, and three points you do tick, tick, tick. And then you can put the triangle information, just like tick, tick, tick. That means one side is small, and other two sides are very large. And you can make equal time difference. So basically, you can put a geometric structure inside a uh, phase space structure. And there is, there is no classical points and top and bottom. But this structure could be converted into quantum or classical representation whenever you want. Because you can go for Hewitt presentation from the, from the bottom part. But this gives you a very, very good tool to do information processing or image processing and deconstruction. So uh, suppose you, put a, uh, you give a pentagon. And the corners are your singularity points, or the resonance peaks. The corners, can, you can split them. And you can find some more geometric structure inside. Those corners are split and put some more uh, geometric structures inside. And it can go on and on and on. But in the block sphere, you can slice it off the corners. And you can put more spheres, and more spheres, and more spheres. When you put, if you take one information unit as a starting geometric shape, and you go on putting more and more, more and more spheres, just to conserve the distance between the spheres, you need to expand it. So it's just like this, this is the integrated information architecture that we published last year. You can, you can get the paper. And uh, so this is what we say the integrate, uh, biological system integrates information. Now, whether this is classical or quantum, there is no point in doing this debate, because neither classical nor quantum mechanics emphasized on exploring or harnessing the singularity. It was, um, uh, I mean, we think that in future we should do that. So the same thing, we, we made a video. Where is Abby? OK. I don't want to miss my flight. Uh, so the, the, this is the starting sphere where, where you hold the triangle. The corners are split. And I'm sorry, for I took it with the camera when during the simulation was going on. And then you get new geometric shapes. And then you, the corners are split up again, and you get new geometric shapes like this. So we wanted to understand, after, after we, we found that what is the unit of information, now the next question we need to answer is how that information integrates. Because nature is not running, we are not, we are not running it. And we are not programming it. There is no human who is, who is running it. It's running by itself. So we, we wanted to, we wanted to uh, be like an idiot who knows nothing but the number systems and, and try to understand if one constructs the resonance pattern or resonant pattern in a cavity, say, seen in a guitar string. And, uh, and try to calculate how d different waveforms could superimpose. Just calculate, go on calculating. Then how it looked like. So uh, four could be represented two into two. You can group it like this. Uh, six could be represented two into three or three into two. I mean, you can take two of three or three of two. Eight could be represented four of two and two or four and two into two into two. So in this way, you can calculate for all the numbers and you put integers in the horizontal axis and in the vertical axis number of counts. Okay? And And the structure that you get is this. Can you see? No one can see? Oh, people here in this direction cannot see. But here in this direction can see. So you can see a beautiful 3D architecture. That is simple calculus. So you can, you can take a piece of paper and pen 
and you can calculate these things. You, you, you don't need a big uh, computing power, I repeat. You take integers and find out how many different ways you can make the combination or uncertainties. We call it map of uncertainties. Okay? And you, you, you take integers and you plot the, plot the numbers as columns. And you rotate it. Okay? And you get I should have made it white. Or that light needs to be switched off. So you, you get to see a beautiful uh, temple-like architecture that, that forms from, from that. So you can verify it, or you can get the file from me. Anyway, so um, I will get back to that in a moment. So this is microtubule resonance at different bands. So we say triplet of triplet. So this is the information structure that we figured out in 2016 September. So it took eight or nine years for us to, to find out how should actually we put the frequencies and, and, and the phase. So these are the three bands. These are the three big spheres. And then inside that, three subbands. So you put three uh, small spheres on top of that. And there is eight, 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 eight octave. So you put eight balls, eight balls, eight balls like that. Uh, actually, not, because um, in the number system, when we plot it, it, in the number system, there is no repetition, apparently. Um, I mean, it's, it's new and new, new and new. So the uncertainties that you get is, is very different. But you, when you look at it, it looks beautiful to you, because there are many different kind of symmetries superimposed. So I will get back to that in a moment. I just finish this, and then I will, I will reply. So the phase values, if you look at any particular set of peaks, you will find that they are spontaneously changing with each other. And from that data point, we looked into it for a long, long, long period of time, and then we, we figured out this should be the structure. When we measured in the neurons, this is coaxial atom probe-based measurement, and, uh, and uh, reflections and transmitter spectroscopy, and then other kind of uh, vibrational measurement that we carried out. And we also found the triplet of triplet. So initially, what happened is we didn't, we didn't, we didn't thought that it should be triplet of triplet. We just, we just reported as these, as discrete peaks. But more the time passed by when you look at the single proteins, protein complex, and the neuron scale, and then they are complexes. Then every time when we started finding triplet of triplet, we asked the questions, why is this happening? So the plot of the uncertainties that I, that I showed to you with simple calculation. You just start, uh, say, you take 400,000 numbers, and you plot them. And you take a smaller part, and you zoom. You get a triplet. You take a zoom, you get a triplet. Zoom, triplet, zoom, triplet. You can go to the smallest scale, 12, and you can, you can, you can get a triplet. So triplet of triplet was there, or triplet of doublet was there. Why this was happening? Is this fundamental to nature? The answer is here. Actually, 50% of the numbers in the universe is divided by two. So one is to two symmetry, you will see 50% cases. And uh, if, you, if you try to find out how many numbers are divided by three, then you, you, should, you should get um, a particular fraction, 16%. 16, 16 so 50 plus 16, 66. So 66% cases, you will find two is to three symmetry. And if you go on calculating the contri contribution of every single primes, because primes make the non-primes. So if you see the contribution, by the time you reach 12, 12 primes, then you will find that you covered 99.99% symmetries in the space. So you, in the, even in the number system, you look at the uncertainties. You can predict with certainties what could be the symmetries. I'm sorry. Hello? With yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. Coming. <laughs> so you can you can uh, you can you can do it for every single component. So various different components and materials we studied. Trust me, and then we we integrated. So so the. So the next time when we present, we will present information as architecture to be growing on the spheres. 
and we can we can we can represent the entire human brain with this. So the conclusions are clocking block spheres holding geometric shape is the unit of information in biology and nature. The pattern of prime and its embedded topological dynamics integrate information. So today I showed you only one way of plotting the uh, phase prime metric in the uncertainties, but there are 12 different ways, and each of them have beautiful architecture and dynamics, uh, spiral dynamics. Classical and quantum debates are not required. It's topology of singularity that is supremely important to understand both nature and the brain. Both classical and quantum um, uh, studies thus far have neglected this particular part. In future direction, we have collected uh, uh, architecture of dead brain um, from, from various people from across the globe, the complete map. And we are going to, going to uh, study the electric and magnetic resonance frequencies and, and phase relationship from smallest to the largest maximum available data that, that could be possible. Already we have studied 26,000 proteins and selected um, at least 60 or 70 of them. And we will try to understand that how nature used primes and its patterns to build this architecture. But because we feel that if we can understand this, we can understand the uh, rest of the things. So thank you very much. Maybe uh, shout out some questions Anurban can answer as he's running out the door to catch his plane. <laughs> any burning questions? Um, maybe it'll be really interesting to see if there's any sort of other mathematical models that he can uh, see in, in, those, um, in those molecules like a Fibonacci series or something like that. So that could be kind of interesting. Fibonacci, yeah. Microtube delay lattices do have Fibonacci. Thank you, Anurban. <laughs> Our next speaker is Jonathan Schooler from UC Santa Barbara, uh, who uh, is filling in. And we're grateful for that, for uh, Drive by Die. So let's have a round of applause both for Honorbon and for Jonathan. So uh, now for something uh, entirely different. Um, for a, a long time, uh, my career, I have been taking on challenging phenomenological experiences. I uh, originally uh, investigated ineffable experiences, uh, discovering the phenomena of verbal overshadowing, which is the finding that when you try to translate a nonverbal experience into words, such as the appearance of a face, a taste, or a color, that, that you can actually lose the experience and your memory for it is impaired. So getting traction on a this intuition that we have, intuitions that are beyond words, and finding a way to get at that. Uh, I applied that to creative inspiration, finding that when you think out loud, when you try to translate your creative thoughts into words, sometimes that actually can interfere with finding a solution. Uh, more recently, uh, I've studied mind wandering and trying to understand how can we take this elusive subjective experience of internal thought and operationalize it uh, in a meaningful way, uh, and then moving that into studying a mind wandering uh, in the brain and showing that you can use experience sampling in the brain in order to discern distinct mental states, including the default network being uh, uniquely associated with uh, mind wandering. And so this fascination with trying to map the phenomenological onto the objective necessarily brought me to uh, the hard problem of, of consciousness. How can we get from the subjective to the uh, objective? What's the relationship? What's the mapping? That really, really thorny question. So for the rest of today, what I want to do is to talk about my efforts to try to bridge the gap. And I want to emphasize I'm decidedly not claiming that I've done it. What I want to do, what I think what we need to do, what, what uh, Rama said uh, importantly yesterday, is we have to think deeply about uh, how subjective experience may map on to the physical world. Uh, Stuart, of course, has also been uh, trying to make that, that, that jump. So how can we think about what is going on in the mapping between the subjective and the objective and finding essentially a place for subjectivity in an objective world. And to get at that, I want to start what I think are three self-evident truths. These are 
truths that you don't need data for, that if you just popped into your body, they would be, I argue, self-evident. The first is, and this is, uh, it goes back to Descartes, that experience exists, that uh, you are having an experience, and that this is, is real, arguably realer than anything else you know. The second is that ex experience, what it means to have an experience, is defined by change. Every moment of experience is dynamic. That is what experience is. Experience is intrinsically dynamic. And then the third is that experience occurs invariably, always exclusively in the now. Now, what's curious is that these uh, three uh, truths uh, have a very hard time finding a place in our uh, physical system. So experience is very hard. There's, as you know, no uh, explanation for how experience, how this three pound meatloaf is able to produce uh, experience. And this has led some to suggest that perhaps experience itself is an illusion. As you know, Dennett uh, has said, uh, are zombies possible? They're not just possible, they're actual. We're all zombies. Nobody I is conscious. And uh, uh, you may not know, but Graziano has similarly speculated that consciousness itself is uh, simply our making what we think of as consciousness is simply making too much of a representation. Uh, he says, uh, recall Marguerite's famous painting of a pipe with the words scrawled uh, beneath it, say ne pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. It is a representation of a pipe, an essentially deep realization. A distinction exists between representation and the thing being represented. In the present proposal, consciousness is a representation of attention, but the representation has taken on a life of its own. So, it's so difficult to postulate, to explain how consciousness uh, resides in this physical universe that some have just explained it away. Uh, similar uh, problems uh, occur for the flow of time uh, and for uh, the uh, privilege quality of the now in both cases. So um, in, in uh, physics, uh, there then this is quite remarkable, but the idea of the flow of time and the privileged present are really uh, quite problematic. Uh, Einstein said the past, the present, and the future are all illusions, even if stubborn ones. And uh, Paul Davies said, nothing in known physics corresponds to the passage of time. Indeed, physicists insist that time doesn't flow at all. It merely is. So there's this basic issue that uh, now, according to physics, uh, this is an illusion. Although phenomenologically now appears to move from now to now to now to now to now, according to physics, this is an illusion. And the reason why uh, they claim it is an illusion is because of the block universe. They think about uh, the past, the present, and the future is all existing in, in a peculiar way uh, simultaneously uh, in uh, time. And uh, so here we have an experience as we normally would experience it. But this is the way that that would be seen in a uh, block uh, universe, every frame existing simultaneously and uh, there being no actual Motion. In order for there to be an emotion, you need to have a conscious observer moving through the block universe. But the problem is, is that in this model, time is now spatialized, so there's not the sufficient degree of freedom to move through the block. So herein lies the rub. Science provides absolutely no way of conceptualizing the three things of which I am most certain. Experience, the flow of time, and the uniqueness of now. And so this suggests, first, the need for scientific humility, that if science can't explain the things that I am absolutely sure are real, then there's something seriously missing. And secondly, it raises the likelihood that science will need to find a place for subjectivity in its foundation. So what is missing? So I'm going to, I, I, promise, I, I promise I will get to the uh, uh, oscillations uh, as we move here. So what is missing? 
I would argue it's the degree of freedom necessary to enable an observer to move through objective time. And this leads to the provocative speculation that perhaps experience requires the postulation of an additional dimension of subjective time that provides the degree of freedom necessary to enable consciousness to move in relation to physical time. So basically the idea is that we are moving in subjective time relative to objective time and that thereby allows us the extra dimension, a uh, degree of freedom to do that. Now, I know that this is uh, uh, rather grandiose to postulate uh, additional dimensions. It may be sort of a course of last resort. And I, I will emphasize that I think that this notion of a dimension of subjective time is still valuable even if you're not prepared to actually uh, include it into a, uh, a physical model. But I'm, gonna, I'm pushing for the harder case. Additional dimensions have proven to be uh, quite useful in the past. Uh, Edwin Abbott has a lovely, so I urge everyone to read Flatland if you haven't read it. It really illustrates the power of uh, what happens, how anomalies can be resolved when you have uh, additional dimensions. In this world, a sphere passes through the two-dimensional Flatland, creating this line which gets larger, 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 smaller, 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 mystifying the square until he understands that there is another dimension he realizes when he's peeled off of Flatland and gets to see the entire expanse and all the amazing new perspectives that that al allows. Since Flatland, science has repeatedly demonstrated the value of postulating additional dimensions. Uh, relativity theory, string theory, all postulate additional dimensions. And I'm not alone in suggesting that consciousness might provide the missing degree of freedom. Physicist Andre Lind, very uh, renowned physicist, has said, is it possible that consciousness, like space-time, has its own intrinsic degree of freedom, and that neglecting these will lead to a description of the universe that is fundamentally incomplete? So let me also just remind you of the psychological importance of a subjective dimension of time. Your experience of time depends only partially on how much objective time has passed. It equally, if not more, depends on psychological factors. When you're in an accident, time goes very slowly. Sadly, as we get older, time goes faster and faster. Uh, as Nordhoff uh, showed uh, so elegantly in a talk several days ago, uh, mania seems to be associated with individuals uh, making, having, experiencing time going relatively quickly relative to objective time, whereas depression is associated with it going very slowly. So the movement through the psychological dimension of time is just as important as movement through objective dimension. In fact, if you think about it, uh, it's more important. If I gave you the opportunity to experience a day that felt like a, a lifetime or a lifetime that felt like a day, which would you choose? So um, let's now consider what happens when you add an additional dimension to this block universe. So now what we're going to do is add a subjective dimension to allow it to move one slice at a time. When you do that, notice how this otherwise uh, not static thing all of a sudden becomes enlivened and all of a sudden experience emerges. So to give you again this feeling, of, so in the standard block universe, uh, normally uh, we compress the three dimensions of time down into two. What I'm doing here for purposes of illustration is compressing the three dimensions, sorry, the three dimensions of space down into two. Here what I'm doing is compressing the three dimensions of space down into one. So we've one dimension of physical space and one dimension of objective time. And you can see the observer is in all at all times simultaneously. There's no way for the observer to move through it because the observer is in every block simultaneously. There's no unique coordinates for the observer uh, in these uh, different uh, dimensions. But now, if we add a subjective dimension, now it's possible to move through objective time relative to subjective time. So by the addition of, uh, a, by, with the addition of additional dimension, we now have both the opportunity for individual moments uh, and also movement. So we've in introduced the, the now into uh, the model. Uh, now notice you can 
see this as going up in the one, and that correspond, each slice up corresponds to another slice in the uh, block universe. So you can see that the isomorphism of these two representational schemes. In this, in this version, this is a object-centered uh, ver version in which uh, the observer is moving through objective time. Uh, but you could also imagine it in another way. Rather than uh, the observer moving slice, slice, slice through time, you could imagine time moving at the observer. So the observer, observer remain the fixed frame. And so it's like going up a down escalator. Moment, 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 moment. OK, now we get to um, two different ways about thinking about these individual uh, moments. Uh, one is a observer, uh, what I'm going to think about is observer window. And the idea here is that individual experience entails successive dynamic windows of time corresponding to the subjective experience between two objective moments. In other words, we are constantly having uh, a window of now, and that window of now corresponds to a dynamic subjective experience between two objective moments. And we can also think about these as observer waves, which is that the windows uh, rhythmically migrate from one moment to the next, uh, changing coordinates in objective and subjective time. So it's an oscillation now, 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 now. Uh, and then each observer may correspond to a unique frequency that that windows in uh, that the window moves in subjective versus objective time. So the idea is that what creates the unity of experience is the unique rate at which the uh, observer window is jumping from coordinates in uh, objective and subjective time from one moment to the next. This then provides a linkage between objective and subjective dimensions, which I'll flesh out in a moment. So how might we quantify the dimension of subjective time? In a sense, it corresponds to information and so subjective time may correspond to changes in integrated information over time. I'm not necessarily endorsing the entire model of integrated information here, simply that to think that every moment in time subsumes some degree of uh, integrated information. And importantly, different entities were going to differ in the amount of integrated information that they subsume. What defines an individual moment? This is where uh, I think you can actually start to create a connection between uh, this theory and actual physical observations. So it's possible that different conscious entities may move in objective time relative to subjective time in different size steps. And uh, this is, there's actually been some evidence for this that I'll show you in a second which shows a negative correlation between vertebrate size and flicker fusion rate. So uh, a flicker fusion rate is the rate at which a, a strobing light uh, is experienced as uh, not strobing anymore. So like a fluorescent lights are actually strobing, but we, they're past our flicker fusion rate, and so we don't observe them. Uh, Healy et al., let's see, Healy et al. Uh, postulated that uh, different size animals would uh, experience uh, time at different rates. The size of their objective uh, windows, in a sense, would vary. So uh, in order to um, uh, appreciate uh, the movement, uh, uh, the, the informational that's valuable for movement of a squirrel, a squirrel needs to have a relatively fine-grained uh, information or temporal sampling rate in order to recognize all of the important movements uh, of its, uh, of its uh, partners. In contrast, an owl doesn't need to have that same level of uh, temporal acuity, so it, it can have its windows going at a uh, slower rate. So they correlated um, the flicker fusion rate of a whole variety of uh, different animals, and then they related that uh, both to the uh, mass of the animal and then also the mass of the animal adjusted for its uh, temperature uh, that, it, it, that it resides in. And here you see that there is a, uh, quite a substantial correlation, both uh, for animals at, uh, at high and, and low uh, light uh, levels. They vary depending on the, uh, if they were nocturnal or diurnal. 
Uh, so this really intriguing notion that the capacity for making a discriminations may actually be the way in which subjective moments correspond to uh, objective moments. And this may be why it's so hard to swat a fly. Flies may be experiencing time, their time windows may be, their time rate, their oscillations may be uh, quite different from us. So to us, when we try to swat a fly, we're going like that. And this may be sort of the way, in one way in which we can make the mapping between the subjective and the objective. Okay, so uh, this then postulates that we have uh, multiple observers and these multiple observers uh, may be moving and, uh, at different rates, more fine grain with less information, more uh, uh, less fine, coarser grain with more information per moment. Okay, next step is the possibility of multiple nested consciousnesses in the brain. So uh, it may be, and this is not uh, inconsistent with multiple drafts and this notion of distributed uh, uh, ideas that uh, we have multiple consciousnesses going on in the brain simultaneously, all operating at uh, different frame rates. This is consistent with uh, Zeki, who said that attempts to decode what has become known as the singular neural correlates of consciousness. Suppose that consciousness is a single unified entity, a belief that finds expression in the terms of unity of consciousness. So I prose the quest for NCC will remain elusive until we acknowledge that consciousness is not a unity, and that there are instead many consciousnesses that are distributed in time and space. And he suggests a, a three-level hierarchy, or certainly leaves open the possibility of further levels. Uh, Micro-consciousness, which are of elementary attributes, such as color and motion. motion. Macro-consciousness, which is the binding between attributes. And the unitary of consciousness, which is the experience of the self. And in my model, these all would correspond to a different uh, observer frames or, to, or observer windows. And so he has uh, various sources of evidence for this. Color and vision motion occupy geographically distinct locations. Um, in addition, they, uh, lesions have distinct systems. And critically, the processing sites um, uh, seem to um, uh, be independent uh, of one another. And then Finally, and this is really critical to the theory I'm introducing here, uh, the earlier sites uh, tend to actually happen sooner in time than the uh, later sites. And this also helps to explain the um, phi phenomena. In the phi phenomena, you uh, experience a, uh, if you had a blue light that was uh, converting to a red light, it, it appears to gr gradually transform in the middle on the way to, be, to the second spot. Whereas, in fact, you can't experience this change unless you've already seen the uh, second item. So the idea that we have nested observers that are sort of holding in buffer uh, some information while other information comes around really fits with this uh, type of phi phenomena. I want to suggest, uh, similarly, and this is uh, consistent with uh, some of the other talks uh, that, uh, uh, that have happened, that uh, we have nested observers. So observers involve composites of earlier level windows. Each one of them is nowing at a uh, different time. Notice the nice acronym there, nows. Uh, and um, so the idea is, is that each window is experiencing a composite of the information that has been experienced at the lower level. So very much like uh, pixels. So like these drawings where you have a painting which is itself the composite of individual uh, pixels. If you can see, these are all Charlie Chaplin is constructed of a whole bunch of smaller pictures. So the idea then is that we may have these observer windows that are themselves uh, compiling lower level observers, which are compiling lower level observers and lower level observers, and it may go all the way down uh, to uh, the quantum uh, level, and it's interesting to think about uh, the, the many different levels of uh, experience that may exist. So this is uh, introducing a panpsychic view. To give you a sort of an intuition about this, coming back to uh, a mind wandering, when you're mind wandering, you're not really experiencing, if you're really deep in mind wandering, you're not really experiencing the external world. That's not where attention is, and yet it's still being fully experienced. And when you're experiencing the external world, you may still be mind-wandering and just not 
uh, aware of that process that's going on. It, there still may be an experience going on there. And so some of what mind wandering may, may be going on when you're actively attending could then be attributed to what we call the unconscious, but it may be that, in fact, there are multiple consciousnesses going on at once. Other intuitions about multiple consciousnesses split brains. Uh, we, uh, there's good evidence that the two hemispheres may be able to maintain independent uh, consciousnesses as well. And um, it seems equally uh, plausible that these individual uh, windows may correspond to uh, vibrational uh, uh, frequencies uh, at uh, multiple scales. As, as Stuart observed, co uh, cognition, if not consciousness, can occur at multiple scales. In, in, in this argument, he suggests it's possible that this may be consciousness too. Scale-free dynamics, uh, otherwise known as uh, fractals, uh, as something like a hologram where there's self-similarity across various scales and frequency size uh, and energy. And this is found widely in nature in many systems in the brain, in EEG activity, in saccade movement, in uh, the eye, and in other functions. So there may be this hierarchical scaling going on. So this notion that we may be having uh, multiple scales of uh, uh, um, experiences of, of consciousness is uh, consistent with uh, uh, some of uh, Stewart's uh, uh, speculations uh, regarding the, the nested uh, quality of uh, waves. Uh, this is also uh, consistent with Nordhoff's uh, talk uh, the other day, where he talked about a temporal nestedness of um, uh, brain uh, activity uh, and the, the distinct uh, uh, components that that uh, is associated with. So how am I doing on time? OK. So uh, if you think about it, the universe, uh, the arrangement of information in the universe is uh, uh, what can be referred to as a holon. A holon is something that is simultaneously a whole and a part. They're hierarchically organized in varying structures. And you see holons at every scale of the universe, from atoms to molecules to cells to organs to peoples to planets to galaxies. And they share common structures in multiple frames of objective time. And it seems uh, quite uh, plausible. Let's see, I'm going to. Uh, here's a, well, I'll. I'll I'll show you this in the next video. It seems quite plausible that consciousness serves as holon detectors. So consciousness, by moving through subjective time, is able uh, to uh, observe edges, shapes, objects, scenes, situations repeating over time, schemas, uh, and so on. And so uh, this suggests that subjective movement through objective time may reveal these uh, physical holons. So here, here we have the same framework that I was showing you before. We have a, uh, an observer window moving through time. And as you can see, you really can't see any structure in, this, um, uh, in the, the pattern when we're static. But as we move through, oops, as we move through time, let's see if I can make this work. Now, as it moves through time, all of a sudden, all the structure is uh, emerged. And you can then see the structure. Um, you can imagine that this would uh, occur at various different levels of scale, and so that observer windows at different scales are able to extract the critical uh, holons, the critical structures, invariant structures uh, that uh, are only visible as you move through time. So uh, we can then uh, imagine that these, we have these nested uh, observer windows or waves. Uh, again, I'm thinking of them as uh, alternate ways of imagining the same thing, uh, that as they uh, move through, uh, they're all parsing uh, in their own, uh, oh, let's see, I don't know if that's going to, they're all parsing in their own uh, unique uh, way. I'm going to skip that. Let's see. Here we go. So in short, I've offered a uh, speculative model of consciousness that subjective time corresponds to a distinct dimension of reality, that consciousness arises as rhythms in subjective time relative to objective time, 
that temporal discrimination may provide a mapping between objective and subjective uh, dimensions, and that this can be construed both subjectively in terms of imagining observer windows and objectively in terms of uh, observer uh, waves. Incidentally, I think that you could create a, uh, a video game uh, in which you have uh, multiple frames going uh, up in which you could really sort of see this model uh, implemented. Uh, I've suggested that observer waves in Windows may be nested at many levels, leading to the uh, uh, handy acronym NOWS, both for nested observer waves and nested observer windows. And lastly, and uh, I think this is the thing that I'm sort of most hopeful of, even if everything I've said is entirely wrong, what I hope I've done is to provide an example of an approach that might bridge the, or begin to bridge the objective-subjective uh, divide. I think we really need to uh, think out of the box if we are going to think about how consciousness, subjective consciousness, relates to the physical universe without just dismissing it out of hand. And this may provide uh, one approach. So uh, thank you very much. I would be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan, Eric von Schweber. Uh, I usually frown on people making comments and questions, but I'd love to get your reaction to something. Um, earlier this week on Wednesday in Free Will and Intentionality, I did a presentation that I called The Conscious Surfer, as I was motivated back on, by von Neumann's analysis in the early 30s, where he identified, based on the von Neumann cut, that one could push the cut so extreme that one has a physical system being observed by what he called the abstract ego, sort of like Hegel's pure being. And when we think pan proto psychist, maybe it's something like that. And this was reinforced by some of Dean Radin's work uh, by almost taking that idea of that extreme cut and doing it by taking a meditator, separating them off from a two-slit diffraction, and finding out that quantum mechanics puts just as many limitations on access to knowledge as does physical interaction. And so I'm wondering, I saw that you had, just for a moment, something about many worlds. Because yeah. the way I saw this is this might give us that extra degree of freedom, even with Orc OR objectively timing the trigger and collapse of the wave function, there is still the challenge of what eigenvalue one observes. And that might be, there might be a preference function related to that that we have as that abstract ego. Yeah, so um, I was gonna try to, to skip this, but I, I left it in my slides. Um, so uh, once we're biting the bullet and postulating uh, additional dimensions of time, which I admit is a big bullet to bite, uh, then it seems plausible to not only add a subjective dimension, uh, but also uh, alternative time uh, dimensions. So at every next moment in time, there may be alternative next times, and it may be that each frame is able to change its angle of orientation and thereby realize a, uh, an alternative uh, next uh, moment. I think that this may be uh, 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 akin to the Everett uh, Many World hypothesis, but rather than uh, going off in every possible branch, uh, it's limited by the one in which consciousness is residing. Thank you. Of course, if you have collapse, then you don't need multiple worlds. <laughs> in fact, if you have collapse, you're actually creating the movement through space-time, and you don't need extra dimensions either. Well, I, I, I have a, <clears throat> if you have these nested frequencies, have you thought about looking at this as kind of like uh, with interference and beats, kind of like music rather than a computation? Yeah, I think, I think that's a perfect analogy. Uh, over here, Betsy. Oh, thank you so much, John. I have a, uh, um, a pretty question is you said that the size of alpha animal is related to the 
the size of time window. So it can explain why we ha feel harder to catch a fly. But why we feel easier to catch a mosquito? Mosquito is all of the same size of fry. This empirical question. The physical, uh, philosophical question is, you know in philosophy, when we talk about time, there is a dispute between presentism, only the present is the present, and uh, for dimensionalism, we have temporal parts. So if your model of time is right, what kind of time theory in philosophy you would prefer? Thank you. Presentism, for yeah. sure. Yeah. That was easy. Uh, Dr. Schooler, yes. um, I assume that this, this movement in time that you described is during our awake states. So what happens during a dream state when we sometimes see fantasies? Where is that block of events? And during deep sleep, when is there no movement at all? Or are, are we not aware of the movement? So um, the idea is, is that each uh, time frame, each, each, na nest, each observer window right. is defined by uh, the uh, distance between one uh, ex experienced event and the next. So um, if you are watching a movie, uh, and a movie is a really good sort of metaphor here. Right. When you're watching a movie, uh, there's a certain speed at which if the frame rate goes any faster, you don't notice that it's going any faster. You're not getting, you're not noticing those in-between things because the frame rate of the movie is actually uh, faster than the frame rate of you. Now, if you say go under anesthesia, mm -hmm. then that means that you basically just had a, uh, a gap uh, that your, your window goes all the way from the last moment that you had when you were uh, awake to the first moment that you have uh, when you uh, uh, reawake. Sure. And so in deep sleep too, that's a, just a bigger window. It's just until a bigger you window. Wake up, that's right. Yeah. Saying. So the window size changes uh, at least for the maximally back uh, observer window, the, 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 the uh, main consciousness. But I'm postulating that there are multiple levels of consciousness. So there are all sorts of lower levels of consciousness that are still chugging along uh, all through that. And in a dream world, is that a different block? or is So in the dream world, um, I think quite likely it's very similar to the waking state where you're getting uh, mo in individual uh, moments, but those moments are now being defined by uh, brain uh, generated uh, Maybe activity. subconscious generated. That's right, subconscious. From inside. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in black and then Uzi. <laughs> you know, uh, the great basketball player Michael Jordan said that when he was playing well, the other team was in slow motion. Yes. So he was probably having more conscious moments per time than the other guys. Exactly. And meditators, too. Right. Uh, Tom Monike, uh, I, I went to a, a conference called the International Society for the Study of Time on the work of J.T. Frazier. And he talked about temporalities that might relate to what you're talking about. But the temporality of a photon is different than that of a bumblebee in the umwelt. So just association. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When you're talking about the scaling of fractal uh, descent, uh, in a fractal, when you go down deeper and up, up, you see the same island or coastline appearing. Right. And that, that is f called the intrinsic of the fractal. So I'm, the question I'm asking, are there intrinsics in the same way that we see coastlines reappearing in your model that if we could I identify those intrinsics, uh, we could then uh, see this cascading effect happening there. So I guess, it, what are the intrinsics of consciousness? Yeah, so I think some of the intrinsics of consciousness are, uh, one of the critical ones is uh, pattern recognition uh, of uh, showing a, a preference for uh, certain patterns over others. So sort of an approach avoidance. If you think about a, uh, a, a paramecium, uh, it shows a lot of these characteristics. It's, it recognizes things, it, it, it shows approach and avoidance and so on. Uh, so I think that we could begin to look at uh, different levels and showing that they actually are I engaging and you certainly see this in the visual system, pattern recognition, uh, favoring of attention to some things versus others and so on. So those are the kinds of uh, characteristics that I think may uh, distinguish uh, observer windows at multiple levels. Uh, hi, uh, two, two quick bit unrelated questions. The first one, you, you do get some kind of a natural uh, subjective time window when you look at something like place neurons, theta precession, and Bushaki, Lisman, temporal coding, the talk that he gave last year. And that gives you a certain natural subjective duration that also projects onto the whole timeline. Uh, second, so I want to think about that. Then the second question has to do with symmetry breaking. I mean, we're now beginning to realize that time 
may, be, may not be primitive and it may actually depend on, on some more basic prototemporal structure. And then you have the possibilities of having symmetry breakings whereby you can have a symmetry breaking that gives you the ordinary chronological time. But you can also have other forms of symmetry breaking from the same basic entity, the prototemporal entity, that may somehow relate to subjective time. So symmetry breaking may give you something. Thank yeah, you. Uh, thank you. I, I do think that um, there's, there's a number of, of sort of promising avenues in terms of the arrow of time uh, that seem to be uh, emerging in physics. Entropy, of course, is, uh, is also a very relevant uh, to that. But even that, even once you have an arrow of time that still doesn't give you the, the flow of time, how it is that we're act or how now the privileged characteristic of now. And so that's the additional elements that I'm trying to uh, address with these uh, observer windows. You know, I see Daniel here was talking about uh, backward time. And since you showed the uh, color five phenomenon, you know, if you, if you fool the observer and go, you know, red, blue, red, blue, and they see it changing, and then you go red, red, they don't see it changing. So there seems to be some information, some backward time referral. So how would that, uh, since that does, can happen in quantum uh, physics, how, how would that fit in with what so, you're saying? So that would, uh, again, be the way that the uh, earlier levels are being integrated into the later levels. So one of the ideas is that the earlier levels, because they're actually happening uh, earlier in time than the later, so they're extracting the information, which then uh, can be uh, integrated in various different ways uh, at, the, at the later level. And so that, that earlier set of uh, conditions uh, may influence how the integration process takes place at the later level. In the back there, I, I have to say that the nested hierarchies in, uh, in experience, in, in dynamics, are also seen in the structure of the brain with uh, small world networks and that sort of thing. Um, thank you for your lecture. I'm a psychiatrist who studies anomalous phenomena, and there's a phenomena called future memory. Are you familiar with it? So would this be like precognition? It's, it's, it is precognition, only it's different from precognition in the sense that the person who experiences it says that they all of a sudden th their visual world becomes uh, pixelated and then they go to some point in the future and then at a later point they recognize that and they, they know exactly what somebody's going to say, exactly what's going to happen next and it's something that's been described by people who've had several near-death experiences, but also nitrous oxide, laughing gas, seems to induce it. And, um, and I read Flatland as a child. My father was a mathematician, and, um, and I studied biophysics. And so I already knew about this idea that time's an illusion. And so I was able to accept that this is definitely a um, possibility. And your, your model would fit with that very well. Yeah, I think that um, once you postulate the existence of a uh, subjective uh, dimension of time uh, that is, of uh, course, related to but orthogonal to objective time, that provides uh, the opportunity for all sorts of time anomalies that are very difficult to get one's head around in the absence of that. So you can sort of think of precognition as a little bit like a wormhole uh, it, it relative, it, between the different uh, uh, dimensions. Um, but uh, there'd be lots of different ways that one might implement that. And of course, I also have to say, personally, I have been studying, uh, I'm interested in precognition. I think that anomalies are going to be one of the ways in which uh, the uh, mainstream field comes to realize that uh, something is missing. Uh, but at the same time, the data on all of these anomalies are awfully slippery. Let me remind her, but we started at 9, so we have, we have time. So we're not... Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. I just want to ask you a question in the context of Anir Bon, who went screaming out of here and so isn't here to sort of, uh, uh, so, so just to tie this back to what he was saying, this concept of scale free is always interesting, uh, particularly when um, you're, you're talking about consciousness being nestled at different scales. And in his talk, he's sort of, he sees the resonant uh, chain as a sort of lock to where it, it, it scale free literally means no scale in that context. Now, he's not here to substantiate that, but my understanding is, is that the resonant lock sort of truly is scale free, and it sounds like you were distinguishing consciousness at different scales, and I was wondering if you would 
if you see that as a, as, I mean, a holonomic theory accounts for that, but, you know, I'm just So, curious. I can't claim to have a, a full handle uh, on, his, on his model, um, but uh, what, what I'm imagining is that the lower levels, their consciousness is all contributing in the same way that, that a pixel contributes to the pixel contributes to the pixel. So the lower level ones are all integrated into the higher level uh, ones uh, in this, in this uh, hierarchical uh, manner. So that would then sort of allow for the, uh, the, the lowest level to really have a, a direct correspondence to the highest level. Thank you. Um, we are working on a model of space-time based on a quasi-crystal. And a quasi-crystal. Quasi-crystal. Quasi-crystal is self-similar, but discrete, exactly like your model. And I believe that your model fit very well for uh, our modelization of time. And we also had the problem that we have uh, five dimensions. We have uh, one dimension. Uh, which is a dimension of change, and uh, which is a change, a movement of a window, a cut window, how you get your 4D quasi-crystal from 8D. And this cut window could be exactly uh, your window, your observer window. So I would like to, to develop this more with you, uh, if possible. Thank you. Well, I'm very interested in uh, collaborating with people on this. I, I feel that uh, I'm kind of over my head with this in, in some respects, both with respect to the physics and also with respect to the visual modeling, as I was saying. I really believe that, that one of the ways to make this model compelling is by actually creating this sort of crystalline structure, as you said, and showing how when you move through it, all sorts of properties naturally that we're seeing in the physical world naturally uh, emerge uh, from it. So I think it provides a representational scheme for uh, thinking about consciousness and, and can be associated with alternative uh, different uh, specific uh, assumptions and, 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 and alternative ways. So it, it provides a, a sort of a, almost like a Feynman diagram, well, that's being uh, extreme, but it provides a representational scheme that could be implemented in alternative ways. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, great talk, as Thank always. You. And um, I've been, uh, of course, occasionally talking to you about these things. Uh, and it, I just noticed something interesting in, in your uh, nested windows. Uh, in physics, there's a phenomenon, uh, whether, uh, both in classical wave theory and in quantum theory, of a group velocity and a phase velocity. The group velocity is the entire wave packet. And the phase velocity is the velocities of the various interior um, waves that make up the wave packet. They move at a much faster rate. While, you know, and, and while the group velocity moves much slower. And it just occurred to me that the nested windows are doing precisely that, almost. Uh, could you comment? Uh, I'm delighted uh, to hear that. Okay. <laughs> That's about the best I can do. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thank you, though. We'll All right. Talk about that first. Let's thank Jonathan for an excellent talk. Really good. Thank you. That was great. That was really good. We should, we should talk. Okay. Yeah, just over at the same time. All right. Oh, you do have PowerPoints, Eric. No, you don't. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, one of the conference organizers, and he's a, uh, a UCSD a neurologist in the neurobiology section at uh, UCSD and co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center uh, for Creativity and Imagination. And uh, he's going to speak, uh, I forget the exact title of his talk, something about uh, resonances and vibrations in the brain. He's a neurologist who specializes in uh, tinnitus and um, things of the inner ear and that sort of thing. So let's please welcome Eric Berry. Thank you very much, Stuart. And good morning. Um, as Stuart mentioned, I'm Dr. Eric Berry from the Department of Neurosciences at the University of California, San Diego. And first of all, I'd like to thank you, Stuart, for bringing your baby, the science of consciousness, to San Diego. I hope that San Diego has been welcoming for you and all the people that uh, have uh, come to speak and come to listen, um, have uh, acknowledged the respect for the great thing that you've created here, and it's such a privilege to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the University of California, uh, in particular, um, the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, which is my home uh, research unit. I have many important sponsors uh, who've helped me carry out this work and this thinking. Um, and I would like to uh, carry on. And you gotta forgive me here, I haven't given this talk ever before, and this is Stuart's fault, and I'll explain in a moment. So I'm a little nervous up here. But uh, I wanna talk about caring. Uh, so there are various people, there are various levels of care. So we've had Sir Roger Penrose here, the doctor of philosophy, and I guess he cares about everything. He cares not only about this universe, but all the previous universes. So he cares a lot ab about a lot. Um, we've had people uh, like Noam Chomsky who've cared about this incredible event in, uh, in evolution, the appearance of uh, Homo sapiens and language. Uh, so he, the doctors of philosophy and his intellectual progeny, progeny care about thinking. We had Annerbon uh, this morning telling us about the quantum mechanics, the science of the small, tiny things but physicians uh, have incredible privilege, and we care about you and your body. And along with our allied health professionals, we try to help you be better. And that's, as I said, a great privilege. I try to convey that uh, to my patients, um, and that's why I wear the white coat. So the white coat at UC San Diego is an important symbol when you graduate medical school we, we call it the white coat ceremony. You get your, your doctor's white coat. And I literally actively use the white coat as a symbol to patients when I walk in the room that I care about you, I'm ready to think about you and try and help you. So I thought this morning what we would do is have a little trip to my consultation room and I would wear my white coat for you. So we've had amazing physicians talk to us um, in our, uh, our conference. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Chala told us about the, the, the event, the end of your life, and the strange things that seem to be happening uh, in the brain electrical activity. So as a physician, I have been privileged to be there at the end of someone's life. Of course, I've also been privileged to be there at the beginning of someone's life. And in fact, what I'd love to be able to do is do the obverse experiment, that moment that every human being goes through, every one of you have gone through, that transition from umbilical blood flow from your mother to breathing air. At that moment, something special happens, mainly a, a, big, in, a big interval of hypoxia as the, as the oxygen switches over from your mother to the atmosphere. So my suspicion is that, that event, at that time, there may well be an event analogous, uh, but the reverse of what Dr. Chala was talking to us about. Again, phys physicians have tremendous privilege. We had Dr. Nortoff telling us about locked-in syndrome. Again, an incredible circumstance to be confronted with a body that cannot be controlled by the mind within. And yet, he has created these techniques where we can communicate with those minds within the locked-in body and ask them questions like, are you happy? And you know what the answer is for some of them? Yes, I am. So, Dr. Hamroff is an anesthetist. I always felt that anesthesia was a, the, unique, the unique medical specialty where they turn off your consciousness with control. He has control of your consciousness and wants to understand that event. An incredible privilege. You, you give your body and its control over to him. That's, and then he controls it for you, looks after you, and brings you back an incredible privilege as a physician. So um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what I do, which is within the, um, the realms of psychiatry and neurology, where we talk about your experience, your lived experience, and distressing aspects of that lived experience. 
Ironically, I'm neither a neurologist or a psychiatrist. I'm a specialist in inner ear disorders. And so I'm going to talk um, about, about hearing. But uh, I've got to tell you first that, uh, as I said, uh, it was a great privilege for uh, Stuart to ask me to come and speak about this. But then he wanted me to talk about this thing about frequencies and auditory. And it's like, I've never given this talk before. So it's like, thanks a lot, Stuart. I really appreciate it. Now I've got to make this whole thing up. So, um, and I will tell you, in some ways, I'm a bit of a chauvinist about vision. We saw visual representations in our uh, previous uh, presentations, um, and they are incredibly powerful. Um, and to me, the visual experience is remarkable because of its precision and beauty. The lines and the colors that we see, this expanse of vision is quite dramatic. And we usually don't have too many disruptions of it, but I'll invite you to dis disrupt your vision a little bit right now. What I want you to do is touch beside one eye. Yeah, and you see that you get a little bit of diplopia. And we don't usually get disruptions of vision like that. We don't usually have uh, those kinds of things. We complain about not being able to see, but we don't have disruptions uh, analogous to that. In fact, people who, who experience diplopia find it very disturbing and upsetting. Um, so analogously, auditory experiences um, have disruption. And so after all this seriousness, let's have a little fun for a moment. What I want to talk about today are inner sound experiences. So we've talked about the inner voice, about our mind, about thinking. And I'm going to tell you about patient experiences along with this. But what I want you to do is create an inner sound experience right now. I want you to scratch your head. Now, you hear that, right? And it's inside your head, right? It's a sound inside your head. And uh, I was going to have people uh, crunch nuts or, or ice cubes or something, but that way we would have had to serve that up. So I, fi I finally figured out, scratch your head. You can create a sound inside your head. And it's kind of strange. Um, we talk about the inner voice, and it's and it's unbidden, right? It just comes. Now we can kind of we control it. And we think about what we want to think about, but this is bidden. I I can control that. I can even put codes. You know, I can do all kinds of inner sounds. What's the difference between that and the inner voice? So what I want to do is kind of take you through a hierarchy of sound experiences that patients have that they tell me in my clinic, and. I don't have any grand conclusion other than some of the things I'm going to tell you about is about reliability of our experience. And this is what happens to patients. So, um, so first let me talk about tinnitus. So who here in the audience has tinnitus? Who has some tinnitus? Yeah, there's some, uh, there's some uh, hands up out there. It's very, very common. Um, it's uh, perhaps secondary to pain. It's the most common sensory distressing problem. About 50 million Americans have tinnitus, and about 12, 15 million of them have a distressing tinnitus. In other words, most people uh, um, have a sound, but the, I don't like the sound. I'd rather not it be there. Some people like it. Um, but it doesn't really mean anything to me. But other people are very, very distressed by it. And that's a large number of people um, in, in America. So there are different kinds of tinnitus. The first one is actual sounds in your head. Uh, the most common is that people can, some people can hear their own heartbeat. Um, again, this is an unbidden sound. They, in fact, they find it kind of annoying, especially when they're trying to go to sleep. But as I point out to them, they would like me to keep their heart beating, so we'll keep that one going. There are sometimes some tricks that we can do to try and mask or cover up that actual sound. If we put a microphone there, there is a sound. There are other sounds emitted in the head. There are clicks uh, from various structures in the head, mm, kind of like what you experienced when you scratched your head. And again, these are uncontrolled and unbidden. However, the most common experience of tinnitus is what we call subjective tinnitus. In other words, where there is no analogous sound in the real world. It is a phenomenon, a phantom phenomenon 
of your auditory system. So when I come into the uh, clinic and, they, and, uh, and I, I ask, well, so what's happening to you? Uh, they say, I'm here because I have tinnitus. And so I say, what's it like? So, um, and then they pause because often it's very hard to describe what a tinnitus is like. I have a bit of tinnitus, mine's a kind of, I can't even really make it. It's a very high, high pitched sound um, with sort of a crackly hiss around it. Uh, and, that, and ironically, that's what most people's tinnitus is like. So you were asking about frequencies and resonances, and so um, it has a frequency and resonance. Where did I put that? There it is. Um, so for those of you with perfect pitch here, uh, let's listen. It's just a, let's try that again. Turn this up. Play. Anybody know what notes those are? Oh, where are all the people with perfect pitch? Let's play it one more time. Middle C. No, it's, it's actually the, the C three octaves up. It's the top key on the piano. And the top key on the piano is a useful and important uh, thing. It's 4,096 hertz, and which is the upper limit of the range of, of frequencies in human speech. Also, the vast majority of music happens within the range of around uh, two, four hundred hertz to the, to the top key on the piano, about 4,000 hertz. And in fact, hearing aids are typically had been designed in the past just to cover that frequency range. However, tinnitus, when we do what we call a pitch match, where we present various sounds and ask people to try and match their sound experience to the tinnitus, Almost universally for chronic tinnitus, there are certain diseases that give you a low frequency sound. The chronic tinnitus is always up above four hertz, usually around four kilohertz. For 6,000 hertz, 8,000 hertz, I've even had someone match to a 19,000 hertz, just a very upper limit of the human auditory range. So um, the way the piano is also very useful because it's a way that I like to describe to patients the organization of the auditory system, which as you may know is what's called tonotopic organization. We have different frequency labeled lines that are specified in the auditory system and then are converted to a, a code signal into the brain that says, I'm middle C, I'm high C, I have the, all the different sounds and the, and the uh, the pitch discrimination is about 0.3% as we go up the auditory range. So we have all these frequency labeled lines, and what we have found through our uh, pitch match experiments and, and other research is that it's probably one frequency labeled line that is overactive. So how does this overactivity occur? Well, this is where the feedback and the resonances come in. So in, the, in the, uh, the hearing system in the brain, um, particularly from an area called the thalamus to the primary auditory cortex, which if you put your finger right there, it's about this far in. It's just right there. Right side, exactly right. Um, there are circuits that are uh, important in sound perception. And they have an engineering term, something called an automatic gain control circuit, which means that if the baseline signal starts to go down, the thing turns up the amplification. Now, I guess I won't, I won't do it to you, but I always tell patients, it's like when you're in an auditorium and you hear that feedback sound going through the, audit, the, hearing, the auditorium system, uh, that there's a feedback loop that happens in the higher auditory circuits and this is the result of loss of signal um, from, the, from hearing itself. And so this is a common phenomenon um, in, throughout the sensory system called denervation hypersensitivity. 
if, we, if we cut a pain nerve, you may experience pain. If we remove an eye, you may have illusory visual experiences. And if your hearing goes down, you may end up with this supersensitivity in the auditory system, which ultimately results in the sensation of sound. And so in our laboratories here at uh, UCSD and laboratories around the world, we have been able to demonstrate this overactivity in the auditory system that is the representation of tinnitus. So, um, the, so this leads to um, uh, some uh, the research, as I was saying, we have the methodologies that we've heard about in the, in the conference here, the high frequency EEG and fMRI, which is actually a hard study to do because it's super loud. Um, so the fMRI studies and the EEG studies show us overactivity for, for, um, for primary tinnitus. However, as I was saying earlier, the large majority of people who have tinnitus, um, they experience it, but don't have uh, any particular value or distress laden to it, but a certain percentage of people do. And so um, what we've been able to do, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Shulman, uh, who's authored the new, uh, new edition of the textbook on tinnitus, talks about the distressing quality of tinnitus. In fact, what we find is that we look at people with pain and they have the same areas of activation, frontal lobe uh, alpha wave signals that are related to distressing tinnitus, and that's in contrast to the tinnitus percept itself. So um, I told you I would talk about patients and their stories. Um, so the first one I'm actually gonna talk about is that doctors are patients, and more importantly, doctors are people too. Uh, I'm literally actively treating a physician who had the recent onset of tinnitus. And he told me that, you know, I used to think about that people with tinnitus were just whiners. And now that I have it, I can't imagine how people live like this. And he was very distressed, and I said, you're gonna give me a testimonial now, aren't you? You're gonna, t you're gonna change your tune here that uh, the tinnitus experience can be very upsetting and distressing, because it can be. So, um, we, the, the good news is that we have a variety of ways of helping with tinnitus. Uh, that's not really the subject of this conference, but since we're talking a little bit about patients, I'll tell you some of the things that we do. The most, impo the most important thing that I do is work on what we call sound enrichment. Now, what if I told you that there was a device, a microscopic electronic device that was battery powered and easily portable and was actually found in clinical trials to be effective for the treatment of tinnitus, do you think people might want to use that? Yeah, sure, they might, except when they're told it's called a hearing aid. So the distressing component of tinnitus versus whether I'm willing to wear a hearing aid is a value judgment that some patients uh, have to go through. Um, of course, many people are so upset they will try anything, including literally surgery, and there are really no surgeries for, uh, for tinnitus. In fact, in the past, they would cut the hearing nerve with the idea that we would stop the sound, and of course, what happened? They made it worse because we, it's denervation, hypersensitivity. We don't do that anymore. So um, we do other things. We can modulate the overactive auditory circuits that are influenced by things like somatosensory inputs, by stress inputs, by sleep disorders. And of course, we can snow your whole brain trying to get to those few thousand neurons in here that are overactive with medications. And you know, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult balancing discussion with many patients whether medications are a worthwhile approach for this problem. So let's turn to something that is not in the clinic, but I've thought about a lot, and that is earworms. Not the worms that, uh, not physical worms, but of course, the sound that you can't, the song that you can't get out of your head. So who's experienced this? You listen to, yeah, okay, here we go. So 
Sure, you've been listening to that song, your favorite song on the radio, and now you can't get it out of your head. And so what I've been interested in with patience and why I was provoked to do this uh, discussion is that, of course, many people have more than one of these internal auditory experiences. We have our inner voice, we can have tinnitus, we can have a, sound, a song inside our head, um, and what I'm interested in is the quality of those. Where are those sounds? So, um, so I actually have a bit of tinnitus today, and now I can hear the song that's stuck in my head. I don't know why it's this particular one, although it's one of my favorite groups. And it's there, you can't hear it, but I can hear it. And it certainly has a very different quality and location in my own head. Um, my tinnitus is sort of up, up here. The song is somewhere else. And it, again, it has this different quality. The tinnitus is this sort of unreal sound. You don't really hear a sound like tinnitus in the real world. Whereas for me, you know, I generally like the studio versions. I, the concert versions of songs, I'm okay with some of them, but I generally like the studio version. So I'm hearing the studio version of this particular song that I like. And it has great quality to it. Unfortunately, it just keeps going. I can't find the stop button on the player. Why is this unbidden sound in my head? So I, I did uh, an extensive literature search. There's this thing called Google. You should check it out. It's really cool. Um, and there is no literature on earworms. But we experience it. Like, we know about a song that's stuck in your head. And uh, nobody's ever looked into this, which is kind of striking to me. It's this, it's this amazing conscious phenomenon that has this great quality, as I say, this, this thing that's usually personally appealing because we've been listening to these songs. Um, it has, again, high fidelity. High fide you know, I don't even need to put the headphones on. I can hear it really well. Um, but it's, it has this unbidden quality. I can't stop it. So it's obviously a subject for more research and consciousness. So there are no real citations in my cursory uh, literature search. There's certainly none in PubMed about songs that are stuck in your head. Um, there is a literature about another analogous experience, though, something called music, musical hallucinations. And these are uh, similar but not the same. It's generally very elderly people, uh, people in their 80s and 90s. So if you live that long, one of the things you might experience is a, uh, a, a musical hallucination, which they describe as a song um, but it's usually sort of an abstract experience. It's not that song stuck in your head with the high quality. It has its own uh, rhythm and, um, and notes, uh, often made up, not usually a recognizable tune. And I've seen them, oh, half a dozen people over my career with the uh, musical hallucinations. Now, uh, in the literature, these are uh, occasionally um, associated with a temporal lobe problem, either a stroke in your temporal lobe or a tumor in the temporal lobe. So when, we ha when someone comes to us with these uh, hallucinations, that's what we look for. Generally, I have not found them, fortunately. Um, but again, these are very distressing. And in importantly, many of these people who've come to me, oh yes, I have a tinnitus, oh yes, I have tinnitus, but I have this musical hallucinations, the thing that's really bothering me. So there's all these sounds, and then they, of course they scratch their head and then they got another sound in their head, right? So there are all these different internal auditory experiences. So now what I'd like to do is change, uh, change gears for a moment and talk about the quality of thoughts. So uh, a researcher named Schachter uh, came up with a paradigm on false memories where he would give you word lists and then give you new lists of words that had similar but not exactly the same and ask you, had you seen any of these words before? And what would people would do is say, oh yes, I've seen that one and I've seen that one. And once in a while they would say, I've seen that word and they had not seen that word in the previous list. They had a false memory, a false memory paradigm. So my other clinical specialty is uh, inner ear motion disorders, the uh, disorders of the vestibular system, and so I'm also interested in spatial disorientation. So we adopted the same paradigm for a navigation um, problem. So what we did was we put p 
people uh, watching a uh, desktop virtual environment, and they were shown a compass and it said, you are facing north. And then the scene would translate and rotate, and then it would stop, and a, and a compass would come up, and there would be different buttons for different selections, and then there was a button at the bottom that said lost. And so what we did was we varied the speed of presentation until it, it was about 50-50 whether people would, uh, were correct in responding. So we got sort of a 40-60% correct response. However, importantly, what was going on, and nicely for us experimentally, was about 20 to 30% of the time, they were putting a direction in, and their instruction was, if you are certain what direction you are facing, push a direction button, and if you're not, push the loss button. So they were only 40 to 60% correct, but um, the, uh, they were only pushing the loss button about 10% of the time, so a good, a good chunk of the time they were putting uh, the wrong direction, and we, and this was, we were given plus or minus 45 degrees, so it wasn't, you know, they were way off, and saying they were confident in knowing which way they would go. Unfortunately, gentlemen, I have to say that this was not a controlled experiment for gender, but the men generally did this a little more than women, so never to ask your husband which way he's going. But uh, women did it as well, so uh, both, uh, we would have, we had numerous intervals where people were um, confidently asserting they knew which way they were going, um, and yet they were wrong. We were monitoring them with high-density EEG as we did this project, and we found a couple of things associated with the, uh, the EEG um, where we compared the correct sessions versus the incorrect sessions. The common thing was that direction is, uh, is a process of integration in what's called ventral parietal cortex, VIP, uh, ventral inner parietal uh, cortex, and we saw plenty of activity going on in there. There were some differences between uh, the, the, uh, the correct and incorrect responses. We also found that the button press, the time to the button press after the compass appeared was delayed in the incorrect responses. So something was going on in there. And importantly, before the button press, we saw activity in the frontal lobe that was in the incorrect responses that were not present in the correct responses. So this is sort of internal voting. Am I right? Am I wrong? Am I right? Oh, I know where I'm going. I push the button. And so there are these assertions that you knew what you were doing, but you didn't. So these frontal sources, uh, I interpret this in, in a simple-minded way that they were voting. Do I know what's going on or not? So lastly, I'll, I'll turn back to patients. Um, and uh, of course, the inner voice patients that we know about the most are people with schizophrenia. Um, and uh, I really feel for people with schizophrenia, I really want to help them. However, they can be frightening. I've been in the room with a schizophrenic patient who's having a psychotic break, and he said he wanted to hurt somebody, and I believed him. I've also seen people so distressed by a schizophrenic break that they were literally coming in and out of the hospital, running through the hospital, and in fact, ultimately, and this was uh, years ago, we don't do this so much anymore, we, we put them in restraints. And interestingly, I saw relaxation. If you put me in restraints, I would fight. But uh, the per a person who's out of control of their mind, uh, at least temporarily relaxed. So let me tell you about two patients who came to me in my tinnitus clinic, who also happened to have schizophrenia. So again, remember these inner voices. So the, the one gentleman came in and um, we talked about his tinnitus and how we might manage it, and he said, you know, I am schizophrenic. And, and I said, yes, I do know that. And he said, so, so I said, well, tell me about the voices that you hear. Oh yes, I hear about the voices. And I said, well, tell me where the voice is. And I said, uh, 
Well, the voice is about up here. It's, it's not in my head. It's up behind me, up about here. And I, uh, and I said, well, so what does the voice say to you? And he says, well, my voice says, you're really nice. You're really great. And I said, wow, that's really exciting. And he says, yeah, I really, actually, I really like my voice. And I said, you know, some people with schizophrenia, they have voices that tell them that you know, they should die and kill themselves. And he said, oh, that would be so awful. And I said, so can you hear the voice? Yeah, in a little bit. So what happens when you turn your head? Oh, the voice turns. I can never see the voice because if I look, it moves. The voice is up here. So recently Gould uh, uh, just published an experiment where they put microphones over the larynx, the voice box, and asked people to push a button when they had the, um, uh, the voices. And what they were finding was that there actually is a voice. It's the person's own voice. There are sub-vocalizations that are going on that the person themselves is creating. And so that makes sense for our person experiencing this voice. He's talking to himself. And of course, if he turns his head because the voice box is associated with that, he can never look and see where the voice is coming from because it's coming from inside. Which brings me to my last patient. Um, I'll vividly remember this. Uh, you know, as a physician, it's an incredible privilege to help people uh, and try and uh, understand their problems and, uh, and help them out. And so I had a gentleman come to me again, came, was referred to me because of his tinnitus, um, and, but also was a schizophrenic. Now, interestingly and importantly, this gentleman was also a quality assurance engineer. And so I gave him the automatic gain control feedback discussion about what happens when he had had, of course, being an engineer, he'd worked in lots of labs with noisy equipment and had, had damaged his hearing, and his hearing was going down, so the compensatory circuits in his auditory brain were going up, and that was provoking the uh, tinnitus experience. But we had a number of consultations where he also talked about the voices in his head. And he had the common one that we hear about, these distressing voices, these voices, you're no good, you're bad, and obviously something that would be terrible to live through. So one afternoon in, my, uh, in, uh, in a sunny examining room, I was there myself and a resident and a medical student. And this gentleman sat and we, we were talking about the fact that he was a quality assurance engineer and his job was to examine pieces of equipment and make sure that they were up to specification. So what he did was he ran a quality assurance paradigm of his own on his own thoughts, on these voices. And he said, you know, if, I, if this voice is saying this, then I should think that. And he, and he went through this paradigm I wish I had a tape recorder, but all I have is my memory of it. And uh, it was about a 20 minute process. And at the end of that process, he felt that he couldn't rely on the quality of his own thoughts. And so that would be a remarkable moment for us to really recognize that we have trouble understanding the reliability of, of our own thinking. Um, and perhaps that's where the auditory experience comes in, these inner voices. As I said before, the visual experience seems so solid to me. Um, and, and we have to resort to cute little tricks like the, uh, the hidden figures, the visual features, like the missing jet engine that we were shown in the slide the other day. And there's common, uh, common visual illusions that we see. But, but they're striking to us because of their power when, you're, when they're pointed out to you. Whereas we all have this, this, uh, this variety of experience, even in, in auditoriums, you know, I'm trying to speak clearly and, and, uh, and with good enunciation for you, also something that I uh, work with my patients on because they have uh, hearing loss. Um, but we've experienced people with different accents. Of course, I don't have any accents. All of you have accents. Um, and different voices and sound quality. And we, so we, we have this experience of variable audio quality less than we do from our visual experience. Maybe that's something where we can learn. Interestingly, and I'll just say to Dr. Schooler, uh, um, 
Of course, the quality of auditory experience would vary with time, you know, the Doppler effect, right? And so, how, so we don't experience in a car crash or, or when we're in love with somebody or we're waiting for that exam, the corresponding Doppler effect of our sound experiences, how can we tie that in to the, our sense of time uh, and where does that come in? Maybe this is a different module, a different uh, thing related to the frames that we talk about. But auditory experiences absolutely are locked to time. Its frequency is by definition about time. And so I'll leave you with this thought for you to consider and uh, perhaps to come and discuss with me um, what, uh, what is the quality of our own thoughts and how can we reach that and how can we, and how can we learn with patients. Oh, and unfortunately I'm on call right now, so I'm sorry, I can't take any questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. John? So, um, earworms, earworms are actually a, a possibly interesting uh, case for the uh, idea of uh, multiple uh, uh, wind observer windows because the, I'm, in your experience, it seems like the uh, earworm carries on even when you're not attending to it, that it's going on all the time. And so <clears throat> even when you're not listening to it, it's still going on. And so one thing to maybe take a note of, I always thought it'd be an interesting study, would be to see does the song progress to the place that it should be if uh, in the, in its, as it proceeds, uh, even if you're doing, uh, occupying yourself some other way? And sure. if it does, that that would be consistent with the idea that you've got this separate module which is consciously experiencing that song and only occasionally are, is the back uh, window tuning into it. Well, I got my knuckles wrapped the other day for using the word module, but I happen to like modules, so that's perfectly fine by me. Um, and uh, so the, the earworm experience doesn't typically seem to be a complete song, but it is some sort of phrases, you know, way, the ways that songs are constructed. So, there's, there's, so it would be a, an important thing to, to uh, come up with this interrupting thing, perhaps, because it's a phrase, you know, sound on the order of like 20 or 30 seconds, so maybe a line or two lines of a three or four minute song, and, or maybe the chorus. Right, so we would want to have an inter a disruption of sort of five or ten seconds, mm -hmm. and I say there's no literature on, it. and it's a this is a common experience. It's, it's, it was it was dramatically so we we're visual we're, we're visual chauvinists, right? You know, the uh, auditory system is always the uh, the the stepsister to the to vision and consciousness, but of course our voice we don't talk about our inner sight, we talk about our inner voice. People so. do report in mind wandering that earworms are one of the things that they sure. Out. Of course, never wait fun. For uh, tinnitus uh, in the very high frequency range, what, uh, what percentage of that is caused by damage to hair cells versus damage to the auditory nerve versus damage to the thalamic cortical connection versus damage right to the auditory cortex itself? Sure. So the question was uh, where in the auditory circuits are the high frequency tinnitus uh, 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 denervation happening. And that order is actually from rare to common. So it's very, very rare to have it in your auditory cortex or in your thalamus, so you could have a thalamic stroke. Uh, the brainstem, again, is usually highly intact. It's almost always at the hair cell level. Pretty well everybody in this room I'm seeing is over 25, so after after 25, above six, 8,000 hertz, we're all losing some frequencies up there. And in fact, if you go and have a hearing test, what you should specify is that you want not a routine audiogram, which goes up to 8,000, but you want a high frequency audiogram, which will show that you have uh, a degradation in the auditory system. And that's almost always hair cells. Back there. Oh, and just on earworms, of course, what I didn't tell you, and importantly, is how do you get rid of an earworm? Ah, yes, yeah, an excellent question. So then just the, before you do that, I, while well, I thought of it, uh, there's two schools of thought. One is you play something else, 
and the other is you play the song itself and play it. And, and I've tried both. Um, sometimes it seems like playing the real song, the song from the real world, will help your brain get rid of this illusory uh, sound song experience. I'm sorry, go ahead. So in terms of uh, slices of time, so when does sound become discontinuous as opposed to continuous? How often do you have to sample it? Um, well, and I guess, I think this goes back to uh, Elaine, who we were so fortunate to have here. Uh, I wanted to play the actual piano uh, for, the, uh, for my uh, sound demonstration. And it's about phrasing. Um, and in fact, uh, I think this is another beauty is in the eye of the beholder because as we were taught, uh, dis discussed in some of the language things, it's actually your expectation of when it is continuous, discontinuous. In other words, when a phrase stops. And so different language learners who have different language representations experience stops and discontinuities at different times depending on the language modality. So some are more clicks and tonal, you know, other than more of the Western languages. And so it's phrasing of, of that actually I th is one discontinuity. Um, inf importantly, auditory en uh, audio engineers have a big question because we want to stop, right? But if we're having a, uh, uh, an auditory uh, signal and you chop it here at the peak, of course what happens is you have a transient as the volume box drops down to zero, so you get a chirp or a click if you stop it right there. So they have to actually extend it out and drop it down to, to at the zero crossing. So the, it's, it's a non-trivial question of where the discontinuities are. So uh, Peter... Up here? Peter Thanks very much, and Eric, thank you very much for your talk, which I enjoyed. My pleasure. Uh, I've got a comment and a question. Sure. The comment is that in the UK now, we're using avatar therapy for voices. And avatar therapy consists of you setting up um, the characteristics of your voice, which the psychiatrist can then use. And so the psychiatrist can, in fact, be your voice, and you control it. So when he says you're horrid, or the voice says you're horrid, you say, no, I'm not. Or you say, I don't have time for you now. Come back at lunchtime. And so you finally get control of your voices that way. And the general consensus is that with avatar therapy, you can give your voices an hour in the evening, and that's it. And that works very well. So isn't that remarkable that we can somehow control this, this inner voice? Yeah. And perhaps it's a way that we would offer our thought, control for our inner thoughts otherwise. And of course, uh, many self-help gurus would, would, uh, <laughs> so, would be using uh, analogous procedures to help you control your thoughts. Of course, tragically, what's happening on the screens in front of us is they're controlling our thoughts for us. Now, and now my question is this one. Yes. Um, there is, I'm interested in mental states yes. of people, and particularly mental states of those who are on the developmental process, which you call awakening. And one of the characteristics of this is that it becomes fixed, and your, your sense of self-identity changes, and with it, you lose your narrative self. You lose this wow. little voice inside yourself, which is talking all the time. Now, do you have any comments on that? or? can think of why this occurs. Well, so that's an interesting one, and in fact, it ties into our earlier discussion about, uh, uh, about these time constants, and, and perhaps, uh, like you were saying, what we might be able to do is, is, what maybe is happening is that these things are being compressed in time and your voice is being squeezed out, and what we would want to do is open the window for the voice, the, the opposite procedure for what's happening to the schizophrenic, where you're trying to squeeze that distressing inner voice, what we want to do is open the window for the good voices to come out. Perhaps that's what's going on in people who have mental resilience through adversity, that they have the ability to allow that positive inner voice. So it's an interesting possibility. Uh, I think we have to end it there. We're actually right on time, and uh, 
this session started a half, half hour late. So let's give Eric uh, a round of applause, Jonathan and Honorbon, <laughs> and come back at uh, 11.40, please.